Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for being here today for the daily briefing. It has been a while. Just returned from the West Coast in Colorado. Spectacular weather. I think, Ed, you were out there, right? It's wonderful. Uh, I don't have any announcements to make at the top, so we'll go straight to questions. Yeah. Thank you, Jay. Um, on jobs, uh, now that Congress has put the fight over FEMA behind it, uh, there still doesn't seem to be a sense of urgency in the Senate to take, take the bill up, but the President has been demanding take the bill up now, send it to me. Is it a bit disingenuous to suggest that Republicans are the obstacle when Democrats control the Senate and that's where it seems to be being put on the back burner? Jim, we are extremely confident that the Senate will take up the American Jobs Act. The majority leader has said the Senate would take it up. Uh, and uh, as you point out, there has been business that the Senate had to get done in September because of the fiscal year constraints. And that included not just FEMA funding, but uh, the CR in general, uh, surface transportation uh, extension, uh, FAA extension. I mean, these, are, these were things that had to get done in many cases to prevent either people being thrown off the job and added to the unemployment rolls, or uh, to ensure that uh, the government continued to be funded and, and disaster relief uh, continued to be in place. The Senate will move. Uh, the Democrat Democratic support in the Senate and the House and, and across the country is very broad for the American Jobs Act. And the President will keep up the pressure because uh, you know what we have yet to hear from Republicans is uh, are they going to support all the elements of this bill? And if not, why not? If they're against modernizing schools, for example, they should say so and they should say why. If they're against hiring teachers back, and putting them in classrooms to educate our children, they should say why. Uh, it's certainly not because the bill isn't paid for. The bill, as you know, is paid for. Uh, there is no higher priority right now for the American people or for this president than to take measures to grow the economy and put people back to work. Uh, so you'll You'll continue to hear from the President about the urgent need to take this up. Uh, we're confident the Senate will do that. Uh, we hope the House will follow. And we hope that Congress will take action on America's number one priority. In his interview with BET uh, Television, uh, the President said that he expected some of these elements in his package would pass through Congress. Why not focus on those that he thinks can pass uh, and, and create a, a more of a cooperative situation rather than the confrontational situation that he's created. The American Jobs Act is comprised entirely of ideas that have traditionally enjoyed bipartisan support. The President believes very strongly that the entire bill should be passed. Every element should be passed. And as we've said in the past, if, if, if at some stage one piece of it or several pieces of it were voted on and passed and sent to his desk, he would sign them and say, send me the rest. Because uh, they're all uh, extremely merited and they're all uh, very needed by this economy right now. I, I don't think, as a matter of approaching this, that the President is going to take items off the table, precisely because there are no controversial elements here. There is nothing here that is anything but entirely mainstream, anything but in keeping with what economists in the, on the outside say uh, would help grow the economy, would help create jobs, and, uh, and obviously the entire thing is paid for. So we're going to push the whole, the whole bill. And if it comes to us in pieces, we'll keep demanding the rest uh, as it comes. Can I ask you one mm -hmm. uh, question on, on Eurozone? Um, on Monday, the President said that uh, the European debt crisis was, quote unquote, scaring the world. And uh, he said that the, uh, the European nations haven't been as quick as they need to be to address it. Is the President frustrated right now? In fact, even today, divisions within the European community as to how to respond, whether to expand the, uh, the, the bailout fund in any, in any uh, fashion. Mm -hmm. uh, the markets seem to be uh, reacting to that even as we speak. The markets, as you know, uh, fluctuate. They go up, they go down. So I'm not going to address that uh, with relation, in relation to anything that might be happening in Europe. We have made clear, the President has made clear, that we believe 
the Europeans have the capacity, the financial wherewithal to deal with this problem. Uh, and, and we have been urging them at the presidential level, at the ministerial level through Secretary Geithner, and at other levels to uh, take forceful and direct action uh, to handle it. Uh, action is being taken. We continue to have those conversations uh, and, and, and make the points that, that I just made that uh, Europe needs to address this, and, and we believe they have the capacity to do it and, and, and the political will to do it. So we, uh, we continue to have those conversations. It's, it's certainly a matter of concern, as the President made clear. It's an inter interconnected global economy, and this situation has clearly uh, caused uh, a headwind to develop uh, for many several months now uh, for the overall global economy, and, and, and in particular the American economy. Uh, so it, uh, that we take it seriously, and that's why we've maintained uh, the kind of communications we have. Your response to charges that Admiral, Admiral Mullen overstated when he said the Haqqani group is a virtual arm of the Pakistani intelligence service. And also, now that the U.S. has openly demanded that the Pakistani government and intelligence sever <coughs> their links with the Haqqani network, what, if any, consequence will, will there be if they don't comply? And how much time are you going to give them to take some action, give the Pakistanis to take some action? Well, the administration's view, as I've said and others have said, is that the continuing safe havens that the Haqqani network enjoys in Pakistan and the links between the Pakistani military and the Haqqani network are troubling, and we want action taken against them. And that is a conversation we have had with the Pakistani government for a long time, not, not just in, in recent days and weeks. It is also true that our cooperation with Pakistan has been extremely important and that Pakistan has been very helpful to the United States in our uh, fight against al-Qaeda in particular. But they do need to take action against uh, the Haqqani network to, to deprive the network of uh, the safe havens that it has in Pakistan. As for hypotheticals about what action we may or may not take in the future, I, I don't want to get into that. I, you know, we, as I said yesterday on Air Force One, we are reviewing aid. We, as a matter of course, we review our aid programs. Uh, but we are engaged in the kinds of consultations with our Pakistani counterparts that you would expect uh, and, and that have, have been ongoing for, for, for quite some time. By when, by when, or no well, I, I wouldn't want to speculate about, you know, if something does or doesn't happen, then something else may or may not happen. That's, that's a level of speculation I don't want to engage in right now. But, but we, we, our concerns about this have been uh, clear for a long time, and, uh, at, and, and it is part of what we characterize, uh, I think, quite candidly as a complicated relationship. Uh, and and uh, but an important one because the the priority here is uh, our national security interests, the national security interests of the United States, the protection of Americans here, and the protections uh, protection of Americans and our allies abroad, and in achieving that overall goal, Pakistan has been an important partner, not without complications, but an important partner. And what about the Admiral Mullen statement um, saying that he did, I, I get the U.S. officials in the region are saying that he did, he did, did he, he, well, he overstated. I, I, I didn't, uh, I think the issue here is that what, what the Admiral said and, and others have said is that we have concerns about the safe havens that, and the existing links that, that we're quite candid about between uh, the Pakistani government and uh, the Haqqani network. We're in regular contact with our counterparts in Pakistan uh, on this issue, and we have urged Pakistan to take action against the Khani network. We believe that that is in their self-interest as well as in our interest to do that. Jay. Well, just to follow on that, just to offer some clarity here, is the Haqqani network a veritable arm of the ISI? 
Well, I, it's not language I would use. I, I, I think that the fact that there are links between exi that exist between the Pakistani government and the Haqqani network, the the nature of those, uh, I think, is, is can be uh, assessed and is complicated. Uh, but there is no question that they have safe havens in Pakistan. The network has safe havens in Pakistan, and that Pakistan has not taken action to eliminate those safe havens. So it's not the position of the Obama administration the, that the Haqqani network is a veritable arm of the ISI. It is the position of the administration that there are links, and that Pakistan needs to take action. To address that, but not and to, to to deal with the uh, the fact that there are safe havens for this uh, criminal network uh, that uh, is uh, dangerous for Pakistan as well as for uh, the United States in Afghanistan. Right, but Admiral Mullen went farther than that. And that's as I think far it's as a matter, a matter of semantics. I mean, I think that the oh. Admiral Mullen was talking. <laughs> about, I mean, it's a matter. Of, you're 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 trying to uh, on the language here. I think I'm being quite clear about what our position is, which and it's and it's a serious one. It's a, it's one that we raise with our Pakistani counterparts regularly because it is of such great concern to us. We have said unequivocally that the Haqqani network was responsible for the recent attack on the U.S. Embassy in Kabul and, and, and on ISAF headquarters in Kabul. So, uh, and the fact that they are able to operate in Afghanistan because they have a safe haven in Pakistan is a, is a matter of great concern. And we have urged our counterparts in Pakistan to uh, to take action and, and, and raise with them the, uh, the importance of doing so. Respectfully, it's not a matter of semantics. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's quite a different thing to uh, say I, I, that there's I've a made there are links and, one, and there, one is a veritable arm. I mean, it, it is, it is uh, they're different. But I, we, we can move on. Um, okay. You said uh, earlier that nothing in the jobs bill is controversial. I assume you're talking about, you're not talking about the funding for the jobs bill because obviously the tax increases are controversial. Well. They are uh, obviously opposed by some who don't believe that uh, we need to make the kinds of choices that are inherent in the bill, which is, uh, we, that, for example, uh, oil and gas companies that have enjoyed you know, enormous subsidies paid for by the American taxpayer uh, that are no, uh, no longer necessary in our, our view, uh, not least because that very industry is making record profits this year. And, and, and again, you, you don't make these choices in, in, in a vacuum. We don't have unlimited resources. So we either, we have to make a decision. Is, is that subsidy to, the, to that industry more important, a better use of American taxpayer dollars than uh, putting teachers back to work or giving an extended payroll tax cut to American workers, giving a payroll tax cut to small businesses? These are the kind of choices that, that, that have to be made. Now, it, I think as we've said all along, if there are better, if, 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 if Congress comes up with alternative means in part or in whole to, to pay for these important provisions, we'll certainly want to look at them as long as they're, they're fair and balanced. They don't, you know, put more onerous burdens on the middle class uh, in order to take action to help the middle class. We think that the balance achieved in this uh, bill reflects uh, the priorities of the middle class and, and uh, are, were designed to give the maximum positive impact to the economy. So you, the tax increases are not controversial is what you're asserting? I don't think they're controversial in our view in terms of uh, the choices that they represent. Uh, and, and I think that the data, data certainly suggests to me that uh, a majority of Americans believe that this is a, uh, an appropriate approach, a fair approach, uh, and they support it. Again, if, if Congress has other ideas about how to fund these important measures, we certainly want to see those. As, and, but, but our our, our standard here is that it has to be uh, fair. It shouldn't, uh, as we have seen in other attempts at, at dealing with other issues uh, through Congress, that it can't be, uh, you know, we're going to pay for this by eliminating Medicare as we know it, or we're going to pay for this by slashing education funding by 30 percent. I mean, those, those are not the priorities that I think uh, the middle class in, in, the, in this country uh, support, and, and, uh, uh, and certainly not this president. And lastly, I, I read something in the gaggle yesterday. You, you, you criticized the, um, or it might have been two days ago, you criticized the Republican presidential candidates. Uh, I believe for there were there was a smattering of boos and a smattering of applause at inappropriate times during the previous Republican debates, and you were suggesting that the fact that they didn't protest means that they couldn't be a commander in chief. Or no, could you I, explain what you meant? I certainly didn't say that. I think I think I said that uh, what I uh, that. 
I was surprised, I think many people were surprised, that in an instance where a soldier serving in Iraq asks a question from Iraq, so he is over there in harm's way, risking his life on behalf of uh, every one of us, and he asks a, a legitimate question about uh, don't ask, don't tell, and what these candidates might do uh, because it personally affects him, and there were boos in the audience. Putting aside the audience, it's not about the audience, it's about the fact that there was no response, no one on stage said, wait a second, regardless of what you believe about this issue, we should thank this soldier. He's, he's over there risking his life for us. And that's, that was my point. And I think that it's an, it's an important thing to note when, when the job that they are auditioning for is the job of commander in chief. So just to continue I didn't suggest it was disqualifying. I was simply making an observational point. To continue our conversation from a few weeks ago when you said that the president who had not heard the remarks by Jimmy Hoffa Jr. Um, was not responsible for them. You are saying that the Republican presidential candidates are responsible for boos. No, no, no. I didn't say that at all. I was surprised that they did not react. That none, not, not, not one of them reacted. I'm not saying they're responsible to it for it. I'm just making it as an observer that just an impartial observer. <laughs> I didn't say I was impartial. I, I'm simply making the point that uh, there was an opportunity there to to uh, separate an issue that may be controversial, although we firmly believe that it, it shouldn't be and isn't, and that's why we uh, eliminated Don't Ask, Don't Tell, uh, from the fact that this soldier is serving his country uh, and putting his life in danger uh, for all of us. And, and, and that was all. It, wasn't an, it was an observation. It wasn't a, uh, I wasn't a, uh, criticizing the, the audience members. I was making a point about the absence of a reaction from the candidates. Yeah. Right after Osama bin Laden was killed, Current Defense Secretary Leon Panetta said, obviously, at some point, he believes a photograph <coughs> will be released. But now this administration is asking a court to block the release of any photograph saying that it would jeopardize citizens in the United States and troops. Why is that the position that this administration would take, given that you vowed to be the most transparent in history? We are the most transparent administration in history, without question. The, uh, the fact is there are also legitimate limits to transparency when it comes to risking America, the lives of American troops overseas. And uh, I think a very sensible decision has been made that the release of those photos uh, would unnecessarily increase the danger that our uh, troops face overseas and, and potentially not just overseas. So. Clearly, your own defense secretary doesn't believe that. Well, again, I think that this is the administration's position, and that's something the Secretary of Defense said in the immediate aftermath. This has obviously been evaluated quite closely by uh, the administration, by lawyers, by by uh, the national security team, and that's that is our position. And I think it's a it's an eminently sensible one, uh, given the uh, the potential for causing greater risk to our soldiers overseas. Uh, following up on the jobs question, yesterday the President said about Congress, it's been two weeks and what on earth are they waiting for? But <coughs> you responded to the first question saying, well, we understand the delay because they had so much else to do. So it would seem that the President's being a little bit cute with his audiences if the administration does understand the delay. So I'm wondering, will he match his rhetoric with any action? Will he threaten <coughs> or say, this has to be done by a certain deadline? Well, he may. I, I, you know, I don't want to predict what he might say uh, before he says it. The, 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 the point is, needs to be separated here. The, this has to be acted on. It is legislation that has to move through Congress, and there is a process by which legislation moves through Congress. Jessica, you know, because you're a veteran uh, of covering these things, that uh, part of the effort here that the President is undertaking is to continue to, to put pressure on lawmakers uh, to focus on this priority because the American people are focused on it and, and to address it. The timing I addressed with Jim about the fact that understandably the Senate had to deal with some issues that could not wait be, and it had to do specifically most of them with jobs and the economy. And we, uh, we know that the Senate will take up the American Jobs Act. The, I mean, if you're, if you're asking me, if you, if, well, no, 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 well, it'll there's a lot of, there's a lot of, I get questions like, you know, audiences. since there's not a 100% guarantee that this will pass, why did you bother? 
right? That's not how it works here. So the question is, the question is, don't we expect that if it passes, individual pieces of it will pass? And so what he's telling his audience is, is we have to pass this entire bill. Yes. But nobody who really covers Congress expects that will happen. So. But you're talking about expectations grounded in cynicism that has to do with the fact that uh, the dysfunction Washington. in Washington, well, but that doesn't make it acceptable. And, and we have been candid about the fact that we believe the whole bill should be acted on and passed in its entirety, <laughs> unchanged, and sent back to the president. We are also understanding of the fact that this is a process uh, uh, that moves through Congress and, and that uh, it is unlikely to arrive back wholly unchanged and intact. Uh, it may come back in pieces. It may come back uh, as a whole with some different elements to it going to funding and that sort of thing. But we're not going to preemptively accept that we're only going to get half because 100 percent of the bill is merited. So, you know, half would be half good enough for the American people. The, the, there is not a single thing in here that isn't beneficial to the economy, beneficial to employment. So, you know, we're pushing for the whole thing. We're pushing Congress to act. And, and, and as, as I've said, if Congress separates out elements of it, passes them, sends them to the President, you know, but again, if they are elements of the bill that he, that is his bill, and they are paid for in a way that, that, that is balanced and acceptable, he will sign them and then say, where's the rest? If it's the tax cuts, he'll say, where's the funding for infrastructure? Where, where, where's the... Uh, the help for to rehire teachers or or to uh, give the in incentive to small businesses to, or to businesses to hire veterans returning from Iraq or Afghanistan, uh, and and he will make that point all the way through. Obviously, the quickest and best way to do this is to act uh, on the whole thing, uh, but we're 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 clearly understanding of you know the way that Congress works, and and aren't going to rule out signing pieces of it if that's how it comes. One, one last unrelated question. You had an event at a largely Latino school yesterday. You have a Latino event today. Uh, is the administration worried about eroding Latino support in the face of stalled immigration reform? The administration had an event, you know, the president had an event yesterday at a school because uh, it, it was representative of the kinds of schools across the country that need renovation, rehabilitation, science labs that aren't older than uh, you and I, and, and, the, uh, and, and that's true for all Americans. Look, we, the President has gone out and, and maybe yesterday, but the President has gone out in different parts of the country and will continue to go out all over the country and, and speak to different audiences uh, about the absolute need to take action on the JOBS Act. The, you know, you know, he's, he, he's, he, he'll speak to teachers, he'll speak to, uh, you know, construction workers, first responders, small businessmen and women, all of whom uh, have a stake in this bill. He'll speak to, you know, working men and women who get a paycheck, who uh, desperately need the extra $1,500 on average that they'll get from the payroll tax cut that's included in this bill. Uh, I think that uh, you know, given the broad support for it, given the, the many sectors of society it assists, uh, there are many available audiences um, who want to hear this message and the President will bring it to them. Um, Nora, if how I are you? If I may, I'm well, thanks. On Pakistan, if I may, um, does the President disagree with the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Admiral Mullen? The President, I'm going to repeat what I said before, the President believes, and it is this administration's policy, that, as, and, and this is reflected in what Admiral Mullen said, that uh, there are safe havens in Pakistan for the Haqqani network, and that is a problem and a concern. And we have brought uh, our concerns about that fact to uh, the Pakistani government on, on uh, numerous occasions, and we'll continue to do so. <coughs> because we believe it's not only in the interests of uh, the security of Americans in Afghanistan, it's in the interests of uh, Pakistan and, 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 and their citizens that action be taken. We also think it's important to, to, to look at this more broadly in terms of the overall relationship that we have with Pakistan and the importance of the cooperation that we do receive from Pakistan in our fight against Al-Qaeda and in uh, 
taking measures to increase stability in the entire region. So, uh, when the chairman delivers remarks before Congress, does the national security team uh, review those remarks and approve them? Yes or no? Uh, I, I would have to check on that in this case. Do you know if Admiral Mullen's remarks were cleared by the White House before I, he gave them? I, I don't know. The, the point is, is that what a Admiral Mullen said is consistent with our position about the networks, the Haqqani network in Pakistan, about the fact that the Haqqani... different language today. You are saying there are links and there are safe havens. What Admiral Mullen was saying was there, that the Haqqani network is a, is a veritable arm of the ISI. Mm -hmm. um, they're collaborating uh, a terrorist network that is attacking Americans. So either they're links or they're collaborating. Which one is it? What we have said and what uh, is our policy is that there are links. I think that is irrefutable. The fact that Pakistan has not taken action against those safe havens allows the Haqqani network more freedom to operate. And that uh, results in increasing their capacity to take action against uh, Americans in, in, in Afghanistan, and that's, and that's a matter of great concern. And we, and we bring those issues to the uh, Pakistanis and, and uh, express our concern about them. Why did you say earlier that those were words that you would not use? Why would you say that you would not use the same words as well, Admiral I just, I just, Mullen, who has been to Pakistan 27 times mm -hmm. since 2008, has probably the closest relationship of any administration official with Gen General Kayani, mm -hmm. knows more about Pakistan than just about anybody in this administration, has spent time with it. Why would you say that you would not use the same words as Admiral Mullen? Well, I, Admiral Mullen testified, and, and, and his, his, his words are there, for, and, and they reflect the fact that we have this issue with Pakistan over the safe havens uh, provided to the Haqqani network uh, in, within Pakistan. I certainly am not, I'm not here trying to take issue with what he said. I'm simply saying what the position of the United States government is and this administration is uh, about those networks. And, uh, you know, this is a matter of, uh, of concern for us, and it's why we, we are quite candid about the fact that it's a concern. Uh, but also put it within the context of our broader interests. And, and I think it's important for everyone to remember uh, that, that the cooperation that we have had, even within the context of this co uh, complicated relationship, has produced uh, very positive results uh, that have improved security for the United States of America and, and its uh, citizens abroad, soldiers abroad. Yeah. Thanks, Jake. I just want to follow on Jake real quick about, um, to use your words then, why was there an absence of a reaction from the President to Jimmy Hoffa's comments on Labor Day, if you're now saying the Republican presidential candidates basically See, have the a president duty... The President wasn't on stage, he wasn't, he didn't hear them. It's a different thing when the guy's on stage and, it, and he, they were addressing a question to the candidates on stage. The comments were broadcast all around the world and it was pretty clear that one of the President's... I'm talking about a real-time thing. Again, I, it's just an observation. Um, on Solyndra, uh, I understand the White House has pushed back hard on Republicans launching attacks and after the fact, 2020 hindsight saying you shouldn't have done it. But the LA Times have a story. You mean Republicans who solicited on behalf of companies in their states and districts uh, loan guarantees through the program uh, and in those solicitations talked about the wonderful merits of the program and its job creating potentials and the importance of the clean energy industry to the future of America. Uh, in our energy interdependence. You mean those letters? Is there, what you mean? Is there, is there a question in there? Uh, 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 and then those same Republicans have now come out against the program. Last week, Carol Issa, one of those Republicans, did push mm -hmm. for clean energy money, even though he's attacked the administration. There. Mm -hmm. um, the LA Times, though, yesterday, mm -hmm. reported, not after the fact, but in real time, in October of 2010, people inside the White mm -hmm. House, Democrats, Larry Summers, Secretary Geithner, said that this loan program has problems. It, does, it doesn't have enough oversight. And they wrote, a at one point, I think it was Larry Summers, wrote a memo to the president saying, this could undermine your clean energy uh, agenda. So my question is, I understand the back and forth of the Republicans, but why would people inside this White House were saying there may be real problems here? Why was that ignored? Well, I think just to, to make clear, I think the memo you're talking about was, a, was authored by a number of people. It was a memo that represented the uh, discussion internally within the administration about this program, and, and I think it's entirely uh, to be expected that uh, 
the president's advisors would scrutinize a program like this and, and might have differing opinions about it. The, and, and about how best to achieve the president's goal here, which uh, was to help this vital industry, broadly speaking, the clean energy, clean technology industry, uh, take hold and grow in this country so that we can compete effectively with uh, the Chinese, the Indians, and the Europeans, the Brazilians, uh, in the 21st century. That, I mean, it would be uh, a remarkable day when, on major policy issues, uh, there were no debates or disagreements or differences of opinion about how best to approach it. And, and the result of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, of that process uh, was some, some uh, uh, you know, actions to improve uh, the program. It's important to remember that Solyndra, for example, was the first loan out of this program and that the program has continued and, and, uh, and, and uh, evolved as it's gone on. So again, going back to the memo, I think it's, you know, memos are written all the time that reflect, uh, you know, uh, assessments by advisors to the president and others in the administration uh, with Last their thing. views. Also important to note that people are not perfect and mistakes are made. Has this administration learned anything from the episode that makes you say, we've got to be more careful next time we spend a half a billion dollars? First of all, uh, we are constantly reassessing not just this program but others and, and making adjustments to make them better, uh, more accountable, more efficient, lower the, the risk of, uh, increase the uh, chances of success, lower the risk of failure. A as regards to this particular loan, as we've made clear, you know, we're not uh, we're disappointed that this particular company did not succeed. The nature of this program is to fund uh, companies that might not otherwise get funding uh, to help that industry grow. It, there, is, there is risk involved. Overall, we believe that the investments are vital because we are not content with the idea that we should cede vital industries of the 21st century to our competitors overseas. It's just, you know, we don't want to be buying all this important uh, technology from the Indians, the Chinese, the Europeans, the Brazilians, and I don't think most Americans want, they don't, they don't view America as that kind of country. Uh, and uh, it, it's vital to this country's economic growth that we, uh, in effect, take these risks as previous generations and previous administrations have uh, to make sure that the United States of America continues to be uh, leading the world in cutting edge technologies. Jay, can you talk about or detail the meetings that people in the White House have had with Ways and Means, with the head of appropriations, Al Rogers, Dave Camp, about the job program? Like, what is the legislative strategy, the calendar? I understand the Senate's delayed, but is there some sort of strategy or is it simply a campaign? I don't have a list of meetings to, to give you or, or conversations, except that well, you can I mean, be assured. Is it real? I mean, yes, you know, it's, I mean, it, I, it, I mean, that's what sort of seems to be missing, is that there is there, is there actual work going on between the legislative staff and, and yes. House Republicans? Yes, definitely. Can you tell well, us some of it? Again, yeah, well, I can get, if you want, I can get back to you, but the, uh, with, with, with more details, I'm pretty sure they'll be uh, rather dull, but the, the, the communications that we have with uh, members and staff members on the Hill are, are consistent and... Are they being accepted or not receptive? Yes, look, the, not, not least because, and perhaps almost overwhelmingly entirely because uh, the American Jobs Act is made up of things that are widely viewed as uh, <coughs> mainstream and effective, that economists view as uh, the right kinds of measures to take if you want to grow the economy and, 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 and create jobs, that the bill itself is paid for. You know, there's, there's, there's broad support for it certainly among Democrats, and we believe among Republicans based on, uh, on recent history for uh, large pieces of it uh, and hopefully all of it. There's so, been progress made. I mean, we know that the Senate at least is set. They're going to do it sometime in October. Is there progress made on when House Republicans are going well, to do this Well, we certainly hope. I mean, that's obviously a more complicated uh, task. The, you know, when the President first put forward the proposal, we heard some relatively positive conciliatory reaction from uh, Republicans in the House. We've, uh, there's been a little less of that, although what I, what I haven't heard yet, what, what I don't think we've heard, correct me if I'm wrong, is uh, anyone in leadership 
or even in the rank and file coming out and saying, well, I actually oppose building more roads and repairing bridges. Can't do that. I oppose hiring teachers. We, can't, we shouldn't do that. We should do something else instead. Obviously, there, some have taken issue with the, the way that we pay for this, and we certainly uh, want to hear if there are alternative ways to pay for it. Uh, but we believe it has to happen. And those alternative means have to be uh, reasonable and, and balanced, and they can't shift the burden, uh, like, you know, help the middle class and then, and then, and then uh, harm the middle class in the same action. So uh, I mean, you know better than I that there's no higher priority right now. There's nothing on average Americans' minds more than the economy, their concerns about the fact that it's not growing fast enough, their concerns that uh, uh, employment isn't, isn't uh, increasing fast enough. And, and this addresses that urgent uh, concern. The President's fiscal plan addresses the medium and long-term uh, economy. That, and, and, and taken together, the, 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 you know, they are a comprehensive, they represent a comprehensive vision about where we need to move this country economically. Uh, are you guys concerned the report that says health care premiums surged um, this year, 9 percent? Are you concerned that this is health insurance companies trying to handle the amount of, you know, the younger folks coming on, dealing with pre-existing conditions, and they're, they're just trying to uh, raise their premiums now to, to, to handle the influx of folks? Or is there some way you guys are looking at this to see if, if this is a, a a result that gets fixed in the rest of your health care reform? And what, what is well, the administration's reaction to this? Nancy Ann DeParle, the Deputy Chief of Staff here, uh, wrote a blog post on this, I think, yesterday, which is worth reading. It goes into more detail than I will hear about it. Uh, one thing I will point out uh, that's important to note about this survey from the Kaiser uh, Family Foundation is that it's, it's essentially backward looking. And uh, Drew Altman, the president of the Kaiser Family Foundation, uh, says, and I quote, critics of the national health reform law passed in 2010 like to blame everything but the weather on Obamacare. But regardless of how you feel about the Affordable Care Act, its effect on premiums this year is modest. So uh, that's the assessment of the people who did the survey. Uh, I would also uh, yeah, make clear so that modest implies it had an impact. Uh, within the context of, you, again, you have to look at the fact that a lot of the Affordable Care Act has yet to be implemented. 2014 is, is more of a target. We're trying to bring more people into the insurance umbrella here with the. Again, I would just point you to this statement. The, 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 the increase was large. The effect of the Affordable Care Act was uh, modest. His words, not mine. Uh, I also think uh, the author said clearly uh, that this was a look backwards. And if you, you know, there are other, uh, there's a Mercer, a well known independent benefits consulting firm, consulting firm, released a survey of employers showing that their health insurance cost increases will average 5.4% for 2012, uh, which is the smallest increase, or would be the smallest uh, since 1997. So there are other, there's certainly a, a lot of other evidence that uh, the impact of the Affordable Care Act will actually slow. Uh, the growth in health care costs, which is obviously one of the goals. Additionally, the Kaiser survey, since we're talking about it, uh, points out that uh, more than two million young people have insurance now with, uh, on their parents' insurance uh, directly because of the Affordable Care Act, a piece of the Affordable Care Act that has taken effect already, has already had this tremendous impact uh, on, on young people in America, which we obviously think is very positive. Laura. Um, following up on the first part of Chuck's question, so just to be clear, are you saying that there are ongoing conversations between the White House and House Republicans over the legislation and how to get it passed? Not, not specifically that I'm aware of with House Republicans. We have regular conversations, uh, legislative team with, with, uh, with Congress, both houses, both parties. I don't know that we've had conversations. I don't know that we haven't, but I don't, I'm not aware of any conversations specifically about the timing of uh, the Affordable Care Act, although we've made in, in, I mean, not the Affordable Care Act, the, uh, the American Jobs Act, in the House, we made it abundantly clear that, that we want Congress, both houses, to take it up. Uh, you know, we don't set the legislative calendar. We, by focusing attention on this need and proposing the legislation, we, we try to have an effect on the actions that Congress takes and the, and the schedule that um, it lays out. We're confident that the Senate's going to take it up. We hope that uh, because of that, the House will act accordingly. So 
What were you referring to when you said that there were ongoing conversations? I thought that his question mentioned the House. Um, if I could be wrong about that. Well, what I, were you referring to? I was referring broadly to Congress, Senate, House. I, I don't know specifically about conversations that may or may not have taken place with House Republicans or House Republican staffers. They may have. I, I, I can check. But I'm, I'm not going to get into this thing where, where we, because, uh, you know, we're going to give a readout of every conversation between somebody in the Legislative Affairs Office and a staff member on House Appropriations about, about this. But I can tell you that we have conversations with the relevant committees, the relevant leadership, the relevant staff on, on this very important uh, legislative priority. You're, so you're certain you've had conversations with Democrats, but you're not, not sure whether those conversations are also with Republicans? I know that there have been conversations with Republicans as well. I think what we're just trying to figure out is if there's actual Which work going on. Which specific conversation? No, no, no. Look, I don't know what, look, let's step back. Work the president the and his team drew up legislation, specific legislation. It is going to be introduced in the Senate. It, it uh, has very specific component parts uh, that Others on the outside have judged to have a, a very uh, positive impact on the economy. Uh, we believe the Congress needs to take action on it. It's not that complicated. This is not a, uh, an elaborate uh, piece of legislation that needs to be picked apart and, and renegotiated. It's there. Uh, Congress should act on it. And on another issue, does the White House have a position on legislation the Senate does plan on taking up next week on China um, currency manipulation? We're reviewing the bill. <laughs> uh, no, seriously, we are re reviewing the bill, and we, uh, we share the goal uh, of achieving further appreciation of China's currency. Um, as you know, and those who uh, in the financially oriented press know, the uh, China has moved some in terms of appreciating its currency. Uh, I believe it's uh, appreciated about 10 percent adjusted for inflation uh, since uh, June of 2010. Uh, but it's substantially undervalued, and we need to see continued progress. And we've made that clear uh, publicly and privately. So you're not sure whether you're going to support this? We're reviewing the bill. And do you have any idea when you might have a conclusion to that review? Uh, not that I could offer today. Thank you. Jay, in uh, speech after speech, when the president speaks about upper income earners paying a fair share, mm -hmm. are you able to define that uh, phrase for us? What does it mean? Well, I, I think it, one, one place to look for it is the so-called Buffett rule that we've spoken about, which right. reflects a basic principle that some very affluent Americans who have benefited enormously, uh, and, and w which is great, but they have benefited enormously from uh, uh, what this country has uh, provided them and, and the opportunity has provided them, and, and, have, and have seen their incomes expand dramatically over the past dozen or so years, even as middle class incomes have stagnated or declined. Uh, are, are some, some portion of them are paying actually a lower effective tax rate uh, than folks in this room or plumbers, teachers. And others, including Warren Buffett's uh, now famous secretary. So, uh, the the principle is simply that we should not have a tax code that allows for um, that kind of imbalance. There's been a lot of, I think, misleading pushback on this notion. People who throw out facts and figures about the proportion of share of taxes paid by wealthy Americans. Well, naturally, people who make a hundred million dollars a year, even if they're paying a lower percentage than you or I, are going to be paying a larger dollar figure to the Treasury than, than you and I are. The fact is that uh, the burden should be proportionate and fair and balanced. It also, some of these studies take into account, uh, you know, conveniently ignore the fact that everybody who earns a paycheck pays payroll taxes, and that's a substantial uh, uh, tax burden on, on working Americans, uh, substantial proportionally uh, much greater than, uh, proportionally greater uh, for uh, working Americans uh, than very affluent Americans. So it's a principle about uh, making sure that um, everyone 
is paying their fair share as, as, as to, uh, to create a situation where everyone can share uh, in the prosperity that we are sure will uh, continue to be um, uh, the providence of this country. But if you're going to put that into law, you can't say, oh, if this man is paying more than the secretary, he's all right, but if he's not, you've got to, the tax code needs a, a number or a mm -hmm. percentage, and a, a, have you worked on that yet? Well. The answer is in the in the in the proposals the president has put forward. He's, he's, he stated some principles about the tax code, as well as specifics in terms of some loopholes that should be closed or changed, like the carried interest law, for example, or the the uh, deductions, twenty eight percent. There's a broader need for for uh, tax reform, and in it within that, it should the the principle that the Buffett rule. Explains should be contained within it. Well, you don't have a number yet. I do not have a number. Uh, a Bloomberg survey of economists shows that the president's jobs plan would lower the unemployment rate by 0.2 percentage points. Is that enough, do you think, to stimulate long-term growth? I think what the Bloomberg story shows, first of all, is that uh, survey of economists shows that the. I, I think it would said it would uh, prevent potentially prevent against another recession would increase uh, growth and increase uh, employment. The specifics are lower than other estimates, and I think if you, and, and I'm sure you guys have at Bloomberg, if you tease this apart, if you look at some of the economists and what they've said, some of them in their calculations are assuming that portions of the American Jobs Act uh, will pass and, and, and built them into their assumptions, like the extension of the payroll tax cut, for example, or the extension of unemployment benefits. And I think one economist in that said, uh, that were those not to pass, you could shave off 1.7 or 1.8 percent of GDP. And then he said if the whole thing passes, you add another 2 or 0.2 or 0.3. So taken together, that's 2 percent of GDP at least, which is what uh, I think uh, Moody's and others have estimated uh, might be the impact if the entire bill was passed. So, uh, you know, generally we think it reflects um, a, a, a broad consensus uh, among economic an analysts about the impact of the, of the American Jobs Act. It's still less than 300,000 jobs, though. No, no, you, but, 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 but you need to look at the survey, and in fact, it's not if you tease out what their assumptions are. They're starting from different baselines, and they're built in assumptions, and I wish we could make assumptions about what Congress would do if it were entirely sensible all the time, but unfortunately we can't. The, uh, it, 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 a lot of that has built in assumptions about what what uh, will happen that are that's already part of the American Jobs Act. And on Chris Christie's speech last night, what what's your reaction to what he said, calling the president a bystander in the Oval Office? And did and did the president see any of those speeches? I can tell you that he didn't. Uh, we were watching uh, the Red Sox as we were flying home. The nail biter. Fortunately, they won. Sam Stein's <coughs> not here to uh, celebrate with me. So. Uh, we did not see it. The, uh, you know, I, I actually don't. I haven't even read it yet, so I don't. I don't. I don't really know about that. I would just say, in general, that uh, in the two and a half years that Barack Obama has been president, uh, it's 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 simply. Uh, I mean, it has been one of the most uh, substantial periods in our in our history in terms of the uh, the seriousness of the challenges we faced. The enormity of the of the crises and the potential even worse crises that that, that this president faced and took head on when he came into office, uh, there were I mean remember the headlines that you wrote, and others wrote, um, you know, imminent Great Depression, uh, global financial collapse, bank holidays, national nationalization of the banks, predictions of unemployment as high as 25 percent. Uh, that's the economic environment that we face when we came in, and that this president addressed head on with a series of uh, incredibly uh, challenging decisions that he took uh, that, by any measure, arrested um, the, uh, the uh, extreme downward slide that this economy was taking when we were hemorrhaging jobs at more than 750,000 a month, when the economy we now know in the fourth quarter of 2008 contracted uh, by close to 9 percent. The kinds of the kind of contraction we haven't seen since the Great Depression. I mean, these this is uh, there were no bystanders in this White House. Just really quickly, why isn't the president going to the New York fundraiser on Friday that Warren Buffett is hosting? Is it a scheduling conflict, or what's the? I'll, I'll have to take the. Uh, what's that? 
It's a surrogate event. I, you know. um, yeah. This afternoon in the online Q&A, the president said, as he has said before, when he was asked about um, deporting people who would otherwise be covered by the DREAM Act, he said he can't choose which laws on the books to enforce. But a couple years ago, with marijuana, he did exactly that. This administration said in states that have medical marijuana laws, federal laws prohibiting marijuana use should not be enforced. So why does the president say he doesn't have that authority? I, I really don't even understand your question. I mean, the question the, the, is about prosecutorial you know, obviously, discretion. well, maybe you should. About limited resources. I would, I would dr address you to the Department of Justice for questions of prosecutor prosecutorial discretion. I can't even say it, let alone explain it. So, the, uh, I mean, the, the, the fact, what the president said is absolutely true about uh, the particular issue that you're talking about. Um, so, uh, but again, if it's in terms of the discretion of prosecutors, I would, I would uh, encourage but you this to. This administration has demonstrated that it's not. <coughs> I mean, that, that you have a, a fixed amount of resources <coughs> that you can put to enforcing this law or that law. And the administration can say, we're going to put it towards this law and not that law. So why does he say he can't do that? All right, again, I, I think. With the comparative here, I, I just I'm not sure how to answer your question. The you know the the fact is you can't choose which laws to enforce and which not. And and uh, you know the president's quite right in that. Jay, uh, just one Mark. just one about, question was my turn. Jay, Jay, can I ask about the Jay I, I, just I one question the once a week. That's Washington all. Post's turn or the New York Times. I can't remember which one, but yeah. Briefly, the Supreme then you come Court, back. I know that the Justice Department's got briefs coming out later today, but in general terms, in layman's terms, please, what does the administration want the Supreme Court to do as regards the health care law? We firmly believe that, as has been uh, upheld by a number of different decisions, that ultimately this the Affordable Care Act will be uh, found constitutional, because it is. Um, does that answer your question? Well, all right. Does it worry you about the time frame that's likely to take place here with the, uh, the, the case coming up this fall and then being ruled on in the middle of a presidential re-election bid? Yeah. I'm not, what, we, we're not worried about what we believe the ultimate decision will be here, which is that the um, individual mandate provision is absolutely constitutional, as a number of courts have already uh, decided. Obviously, some have decided uh, otherwise, but we believe ultimately that this will be um, resolved in, in, the favor, in, in the favor of the constitutionality, constitutionality of the act. Has the administration decided it's a good thing to get this resolved as quickly as it can because of the uncertainty? Uh, no, I think we've been following, you know, we've been moving, it's been moving through the process and, and, and we continue to uh, argue the merits of it. And, and the process will continue. We're not, uh, again, we're very confident that it's, uh, it will be found to be constitutional. Yeah. Yeah, Mark, just one more question. question. Just yeah, yeah. Can you follow up on Mark's question? Mm -hmm. Why didn't you, I mean, isn't it clear you do want to speed up the process, or you guys would have asked for another appeal? Well, yeah, I think yeah. you're asking well, that question certain. backwards. I mean, we're not trying to slow down the process, if that's what you're asking. We're letting the process. actually speed it up. Well, no, we're just simply. On to the full appeals court. We could have, uh, I guess, but we didn't. Um, I don't think we thought it was necessary. The let me find if I have anything specific on that here. Um, you know, I think I'd remind you that two appellate courts have previously ruled in favor of the Affordable Care Act, and we're confident, as I said, that the uh, that when all these cases are resolved, that we will prevail. I, I, you know, not taking action is not. Um, doesn't mean we're trying to speed anything up, but we're also not trying to speed any, you know, slow anything down. We're just we're confident that when it comes up, uh, it will be uh, seen as constitutional because we're quite convinced that it meets that bar, yeah, clears that bar. On the Vienna we're in the seats. They're not here. <laughs> I know, but the seats represent organizations. I get it. But Connie and then Lester. Okay. But but I mean, seat. those seats are you know how it works, Connie. I mean. These people travel. Yes, I mean, we're seniors. <laughs> yes. We're Do you have seniors. a question about? I, Libya okay. yes. Iran. Do okay. you have any update on the threats by the Iranians to bring some of their naval ships off the uh, U.S. coast? And also any update on a missing Libyan missile? Um, okay, let me, I'll, I'll take them in that order. Uh, um, on the 
Iranian uh, Navy, I think uh, we don't take these statements seriously. And uh, given that they do not reflect at all Iran's naval capabilities. Uh, as for the erroneous report about uh, man pads, um, it is simply not accurate that 20,000 shoulder-fired weapons are missing uh, when 20,000 is the number of weapons uh, that we have assessed uh, the Qaddafi regime may have acquired over the last 40 years. Uh, so that's an erroneous report. However, it is certainly true, as we have been talking about uh, quite openly for weeks, if not months, and as Ben Rhodes, the Deputy National Security Advisor, briefed on extensively in New York at the United Nations, uh, the issue of uh, conventional weapons, including man pads, uh, in Libya. And that is why we have a State Department official on the ground there. We have five other uh, contract officials dealing with this. It's why we've been uh, discussing the, the issue with the TNC uh, regularly and, and working with NATO and our uh, allies and partners on this issue. Um, so I think that's the answer to that. Uh, uh, that's uh, uh, thank you. Just one question. I'm sure. The PLO oh, takes two. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> the PLO's UN Ambassador Arakat has been quoted by the Washington Times and other media as saying, and this is a quote, it would be in the best interest of the two peoples that the proposed future Palestinian state be free of Jews. And my question, does the White House believe that this statement is or is not Juden reign? Is not what? Juden reign. Free of Jews. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, sorry. No Jews. Free of Jews. The, uh, a Nazi term. Yes. Um, we obviously don't believe that we, we believe that any action taken by either side that makes it harder to come together and in direct negotiations to resolve the issues between the two parties so that we can have a two-state solution that both sides support uh, is not helpful, not conducive. And that would include actions as well as statements. Uh, uh, that would apply to that. I have not seen that statement, so I don't, I don't even know if it's accurate, but it would not be, uh, it's not helpful. Listen, thank you. Uh, thank That's you why. very much. Yes. Thank you, Jay. On the issue of, of the Israeli settlements, has the U.S. been in contact with any of the countries in the region um, following, following the announcement? Uh, you might want to address that to the State Department. I, I, I made clear yesterday that we're deeply disappointed by that announcement. Uh, going back to the point I just made to Lester, the, we, support measure, we support actions and words that, by each side that move the parties closer to direct negotiations because that is the only way that uh, the Palestinians will achieve their goal of a sovereign state. And, uh, and uh, as part of that, uh, the Israelis will uh, achieve the kind of security that they greatly deserve uh, in a Jewish state. So that direct negotiations are the only way to go. Actions that make it harder to achieve that are not helpful, not conducive to the, uh, to the goal here. Well, the question was asked to the State Department, and they basically said what you said, so. Um, but is they there said ask the State Department? What's that? I mean, in terms of have we had, con I, I just don't know if we have had, I mean, I, I imagine rarely a day goes by that we don't have consultations with our uh, uh, partners in the region, so I, I'm sure that. On this issue specifically, I don't know. Last one. Yeah. Just to follow up on this, um, in the light of Israel's decision to build the settlements, what is the administration doing to prepare the ground to bring the two parties together? We are working assiduously towards that goal we, with, our, with the quartet, with others, uh, with the two parties, um, the Palestinians and the Israelis. I think we were quite clear uh, about our opinion of this announcement yesterday. And uh, just as we were quite clear about the inefficacy of uh, pursuing unilateral action at the United Nations. We, we encourage both sides to take actions to achieve uh, the goal here that they both seek. Thank you. Oh, Jay, how many man pads are missing? If it's not 20,000, how many are missing? Yeah, I was just taking issue with an erroneous report. I don't have a number.